Hello everybody, it's Glass Half Dead here with my Beginner's Kill Team series part, I think this is number four now. So we've just had our buyer's guide, two boxes plus one extra miniature, and I'm now going to show you a list for every single faction using just what you've bought from the last video. If you just want to go and see the particular faction you're interested in, all of the timestamps are in the description and the top comment below, so check those out. However, before I can tell you what list to build, I need to tell you how a kill team roster works and everything about that. Now, please remember, the purpose of this guide isn't to give you the best possible list in every possible situation, because that's not really how kill team works. You can always mix it up and make your list more optimal thanks to your roster. I'm also not saying that you always have to play the most optimal list. Really, you should play the game however you want. The purpose of these lists are to show you possible ways of building a team and to show you ways that can really hold their own against other people. Because there's nothing worse than being really excited to play your first game of Kill Team and accidentally building the worst possible list in every possible situation and then being really confused about why you didn't do very well. So this really is just a rough guide for you to get started in Kill Team until you figure out the exact game that you want to be playing. A kill team roster is a list of 20 different models that all share the same faction keyword. That is essentially it. That is the absolute basics of a kill team roster. Let's quickly talk about a faction keyword. The faction keyword, for example, you can see behind me here, is Adeptus Astartes. Now, if you're interested in playing open play or narrative, you can kind of ignore that. Don't worry. But if you want to play any match play games or competitive games, then you must have a battle forged kill team, which just means that everything in this particular instance must have the faction keyword of Adeptus Astartes. Now you might think Space Marines, well that means I can include Death Watch or Grey Knights as well. But they actually have a faction keyword not of Adeptus Astartes, but of Grey Knights or Death Watch, so they won't be able to be taken with Adeptus Astartes or regular Space Marines. I mentioned it earlier, but you are limited to 20 spaces. The reason for this is we're striving for balance and one of the amazing parts of Kill Team, and this is truly something that sets it apart from Big 40k or Apocalypse or anything else, is the way a roster is used. When you're going into your first game, or possibly not your first game, but your first competitive game, you will have every single option on your 20 model list, even though, for example, in a regular game of Adeptus Astartes, you might only be able to fit six or seven models. That means you are able to tailor your list for exactly the enemy you're facing against. And so having a limited number of spaces that you can fill your roster up with is actually a really big part of the meta game. That's the game outside of the game. Now, when it comes to building a list from your roster, you're going to need to know the point level that you need to build a list for. However, when you're just building the roster, you don't need to take that into account. A roster might end up being three, four, 500 points worth of models with your 20 models there. And so if you wanted, you could take the same roster into a 100 point game or a 125 point game or even a 200 point game and simply pick different lists from within your original 20-man roster. And we need to have a quick word about specialists. Now, when you're building your roster, you can only have one specialist of every type. So, for example, you can have one heavy, one comms, one demolitions, one leader. But you wouldn't be allowed to have, say, two comms, even if, if we look at the data sheets behind us, one of the comms was from a scout and one of the comms was from a tactical marine. That's still the same specialism and you can't do that twice. However, when you're putting together your roster, remember that you can have as many of each specialism as you want. So you could have five different leaders on there if you have them each loaded out for a different opponent perhaps. And a final note on building your roster is what exactly a leader is. When we say the word leader in Kill Team, we are specifically talking about the model that is being given the specialist keyword leader. So looking again at the data sheets behind us, we can see there is a scout sergeant who can be a leader, as we see here, leader, sergeant only. And then for the tactical marines, there is a tactical sergeant, leader, sergeant only. Now you could have a scout sergeant be your leader specialist, 
but you can then still take a tactical sergeant who isn't a specialist. Now, obviously, building a roster is a bit of an art within itself, and it takes a little bit of an understanding of the game, and hopefully, throughout the rest of this video, I can help you out with that. Now, everything I'm about to show you, although it's going to be shown in a roster format, is actually only a list, and I am giving you a basic 100 point take all comers list for every single faction. So I'm not going to be using every single model that you might have just purchased from the previous video. You may have a lot of models left over, and you may decide that you want to fill out the rest of your roster using them in different configurations. And you might even find out that after taking my original list and adding the rest of the models, you might even come up with a better list for yourself. Now, let's get into it, and we start off with, of course, Adeptus Astartes. So using two intercessors, one of them will have an ore specs from your first strike kit, along with one of the Reavers, you get the first three members of your team. One of the regular intercessors you are going to call your intercessor sergeant, just with a regular bolt rifle, he's your leader. The Reaver sergeant is going to be having a combat knife and a bolt carbine, and that's going to be your combat. Now with him you can really get stuck in putting out an amazing five attacks a turn, strength four, it's really quite powerful. The reason I went with the bolt carbine instead of the bolt pistol is because you are going to almost certainly not charge turn one, but you probably want to arrange him so that he is in a position to charge for turn two. So you're probably advance, which means you won't be able to shoot the pistol if that's what you've got. The pistol is still a good option though, because the Reaver Sergeant there is pretty tough to kill. So chances are good that he will survive the first round of close combat, and if he hasn't killed anything, he will be able to shoot that pistol during the second round of being in combat. Now the intercessor with bolt rifle and ore specs is going to be a comms. You can use the comms and the ore specs together to make somebody on your team hit on twos, which is absolutely fantastic. And I've paired him with a lovely scout gunner, missile launcher and scout gunner, heavy bolter. Two really strong units. The missile launcher is a very strong pick because if you're up against anything that is very hard to take down, you use a crack missile shot. And if you're up against a horde, you can use the frag, potentially getting up to six attacks. You split that three and three, chances are pretty good against any horde army, you're going to take them out. Now I've made him a heavy. The reason for that is because as great as the missile launcher is, he is relatively fragile for a space marine. You really want him to get work done and you don't want to be taking that m negative anytime you move. The scout gunner with a heavy bolter is again, just a really solid pick. And then of course we have the Eliminator Sergeant Bolt Sniper Rifle. The reason I went with an Eliminator Sergeant is because I didn't have anything that I wanted to spend the extra point on, and he does get an extra attack and leadership, I believe. So what you have here are four Primaris models, which are actually going to be really difficult to take down. Your biggest threat is going to be Plasma. If you come up against a Plasma team, you're going to really struggle, but Keep in mind that anything taking heavy plasma against you is going to be pretty scared of your missile launcher, your heavy bolter, and your eliminator. So you just have to make sure you've got good lines of sights and strike first. Now if you've picked up the Elite's book, I would recommend for a sub-faction, Salamanders. There are of course other ways to play Adeptus Astartes, but for your first attempt, if you don't have a particular theme you've decided to go for, Salamanders is very strong indeed. Okay, now if you're watching this from the start instead of jumping around, you're going to notice something a little bit weird about the Adeptus Sororitas. And that is that they actually have four specialists as well as the leader. The reason for that, in case you don't know, is that any specialist retainer, as they are called, which when it comes to my lists are only going to be Pius Vaughan and Gottfried de Montbard, are allowed to be an additional specialist. Now, you can't take two of that specialism, so by taking Pius Vaughan, you have removed the Zealot specialism as something anything else can take, but it is an additional specialism, which is inherently pretty good for you. Now, the Sister Superior is just a regular model, essentially, from the Battle Sister Squad. A bolt gun, a bolt pistol, because that's what she comes with, and she's your leader. Nothing particularly special there, uh, but you know, a bolt gun, decent to sit back on an objective, and that's probably what you want to be doing with your leader in general anyway. 
Now Pius Vaughan and the Battle Sister Gun of the Heavy Flamer kind of work in tandem. With them you want to run up the board and really put down some pressure. You can really control an area very well with two heavy flamers, it's very scary. And of course if you actually have the enemy coming towards you that's practically better as they have to charge flamers which is ideal for you. Now I've made the heavy flamer a demolition, the reason for that is that you will be strength 5 which means you will never be wounding anything basically on 2s. But with the demo, if they're obscured, you will be going to wounding on twos. It's just a solid pick. Next up we have another battle sister gunner, this time with a storm bolter. Although the sisters have a lot of interesting heavy weapons they can take, a lot of it gets a bit expensive and I didn't have the points to spare. And the real reason for taking the storm bolter over anything else is that there is a tactic that allows you to effectively make it a super storm bolter. And the reason it's also a heavy is so that you can double up on that one tactic spend one CP, which is your heavy stratagem, for more bullets, giving you five shots, very devastating. Now there's another battle sister at the bottom there, who's your comms, that's just to help out your storm bolter more than anything else. Try and stick those two together. Then you have an endurant and two arco flagellants, who are, let's be honest, very strong melee models. Charge them up, stick them into anything, and they have a really, really good chance of getting to the injury roll. They're really strong models. Adeptus Mechanicus. First up we have a Ranger Alpha as a leader. The reason for this is that the Galvanic Rifle is a 24 inch range gun. Some people like to take the leader with a close combat weapon and a pistol so that they can get stuck in if they need to, but I personally like to keep my leader at the back. There's two reasons for that. One, it helps keep them alive, generally, and also it helps you shield out your back lines from any enemy models that want to try and deep strike in. Then we have a Vanguard Gunner with a Plasma Calavat as a Sniper. The reason for that is pretty obvious to most of you I'm sure, and that is that on the roll of a 1, a Plasma weapon of any type will remove your model, whereas a Sniper allows you to re-roll 1s, so it's giving you a nice big safety net there. We then have another Vanguard Gunner with an Arc Rifle. Some of you uh, veterans out there might be wondering why, and don't forget we are only using one box of Skatari which only comes with a single Plasma Calibre. If you happen to have another Plasma Calibre in your bits box, you should probably use that, or at least proxy one. But for this I'm sticking true and we're going with an Arc Rifle. Our combat is an Infiltrator Princeps with Fleshette, Blaster and Taser Goad. The reason for this is that we're trying to make a take all comers list and generally the taser gold is pretty good at killing whatever it gets into combat with even if it doesn't have AP like the power sword. Then we have a Rustwalker Princeps with Transonic Blades. Now the Rustwalker Princeps also comes with a Cord Claw. I would advise you not to bother. Generally I have had more luck with the Transonic Blades over the Cord Claw but you do you. We then have two more Skatari Vanguard, one with an Omni Specs, one with the comms. This is a classic pairing you're going to see across any faction that can take it. You want to keep this next to your Plasma Calibre so that you're hitting anything on twos and re-rolling ones. It's a very deadly pairing and essentially can remove a model a turn, very strong. Finally we have a Ranger Gunner with a Transoranic Arquebus. Now the Transoranic Arquebus isn't typically the most favoured gun out there. Because we are limited to a single box of Skatari, we didn't really have points for anything else. If you really wanted, you could swap him out for another Rust Stalker or another Infiltrator, but that's your choice. But I felt that Admecha typically played as a ranged army, so this is probably the better pick. A really good beginner sub-faction for Adeptus Mechanicus is Metallica, but you could also give Mars a go if you like something a bit more random and fluffy. Astra Militarum. There are so many ways to build these guys, but I've gone again with something that I think will be able to handle pretty much whatever you throw at it. There's a standard sergeant with a bolt pistol and a power sword. Now the power sword isn't standard, but I had extra points to spare, so what can I do? That's a leader. The Gottfried de Montbard, for those of you that haven't followed the whole thing, is a combat and he is a fourth specialist, because specialist retainers allow you to take a fourth specialist, but that specialism, in this case combat, cannot clash with any other specialism. So for example, you couldn't take a, another combat specialist, but you can still take three of any other. We've got a Scion Gunner with a Plasma Gun and a Sniper. It's a classic pairing, you're gonna see it a lot. The Plasma Gun will kill you if you roll a one, but Sniper allows you to re-roll that one. Makes sense. 
You then got a Scion Gun with a Hotshot Volley Gun, and you are a heavy specialist. The Hotshot Volley Gun is a heavy weapon, so if you were to move with it, without being a heavy specialist, you'd be at minus one to hit, but heavy allows you to do that. We've then got four Flamers, one of them's a demo. Honestly, flamers are great weapons. Yes, they're a little bit hit or miss with their 1d6 shots, but honestly, once you learn how they work, you can put down some real board control with four of them. It's crazy. Finally, we have another Scion Gunner with Hotshot Volley Gun. A lot of people would probably say, here, you want to take a Plasma Gun, but as you've already used your Sniper spec, you probably don't want to have a dedicated model that you will be spending your tactical rerolls on if you roll a 1, and the Hotshot Volley Gun is pretty good. Notice here that you do have three Scions. One of the common tactics to use with Astra Militarum is to hot drop your Scions. It's one CP and you can drop up to three Scions anywhere on the board outside of five inches from the enemy. And I assure you having two Hotshot Volley Guns and one Plasma Gun turn up right next to your leader is going to cause any enemy to panic. As a sub-faction, I would recommend Valhallen. It makes you really hard to break. Don't forget that your guys are going to die pretty easily here, but as Valhallen, you have to lose a lot of guys before you start breaking. As a Yarni. Now we've bought a Guardian Defenders box, a Dire Avengers box, and a single Howling Banshee. We take a regular Guardian Defender as our leader, because he's just going to sit at the back, and he's going to hang around with our heavy weapon platform, able to shoot it. Then, of course, we have a Dire Avenger X-Arch, an absolutely excellent model, and we kit them out with two Avenger Shuriken Catapults, and we make them our Veteran. The reason for Veteran, the reason for making them a Veteran is that you're already a very fast model, but sometimes you're going to want to get to the other end of the board, turn one, possibly to put pressure on the enemy, or to score an objective of some sort, and this allows you to do that. Then a Howling Banshee X-Arch with Shuriken Pistol and Executioner as a combat. This is an amazing model. The real strength of the Howling Banshee is that they can charge any enemy model and the enemy model doesn't get to react at all. So that means you're not at risk of Overwatch, which is brilliant if you're going up against anyone with Flamers, but also the enemy cannot retreat, which is moving back three inches. We then have a Guardian Defender with comms. You're going to want to keep this next to your heavy weapon platform typically so that your heavy weapon platform can probably be hitting on twos or threes every single time. Then we take another Dire Avenger because we had the points to spare and five Guardian Defenders. That's going to give you a lot of guys to run around the board and don't forget that when you roll sixes on your regular weapons, you're at AP minus three. Now when it comes to sub-faction, you actually have three very strong sub-factions. You want to be looking at Ulthway, Bealtan or Iandon. They're all good in different situations, but if you don't want to think about it too much, just go with Ulthway, which means every time you take a wound on a 6, you ignore the wound. Custodes. Now we've only bought a single box of Custodian Guard, so you only need to build 3 models. If you want, this is a great time to learn magnetizing, and you can give all of them both a Storm Shield and a Guardian Spear loadout option. But if you don't want to do that, I would re recommend running a leader with the Storm Shield as that makes him extra tough, always getting a 3-up invuln save, and then a combat and a zealot. And of course those two will have misericordias, which gives them an extra attack in melee. Sometimes people will look at custodies and think that they're, you know, capable at long range, and they are. They aren't bad at long range, but they are much stronger in combat, hence going with combat and zealot for specialisms. Chaos Demons. So for this we're taking Iridescent Horror as a leader. The reason for this is that again we are limited to two boxes plus in this case a third box and we don't have what people normally take as a leader which is a Plague Bearer. The Iridescent Horror however, although it's only T3, does have a 4 up invulnerable save so that's probably your best bet. We then have a Blood Reaper which is the sergeant model for blood letters as a combat because he can get some serious work done. We then have a pink horror as a demo and a blood letter as a veteran, followed by two pink horrors, two blood letters, and two more blood letters, one with an icon bearer and one with a horn blower. These are allowing you to re-roll and extend your charges with all of your blood letters. Basically, with this you want to move your blood letters up as a pack and just swarm the enemy, and I assure you it can work, whilst all of your horrors go onto your objectives and just make sure that the enemy can never remove them from it, basically. 
Death Guard. A nice simple list for you here. You'll take a Plague Champion as your leader with a Plague Sword, which is upgraded for free from a Plague Knife and a Bolt Gun. Nothing overly special there. One option here is to give the Plague Champion a Plasma Gun, but I'm pretty scared to put a Plasma Gun onto my leader, so I don't typically do that, but it's something you can do. We then take two Plague Marine Gunners with Blight Launchers. Now these Blight Launchers are really, really good. We take one as a demo, one as a heavy. You can just sit at the back of the board and kill stuff all day with these two. They're great newbie weapons. We then have a Plague Marine Fighter with a Flail of Corruption as a veteran. Some people like to take this guy as a combat or even a zealot, but honestly the Flail of Corruption does so much damage I don't feel you need the extra attack. The reason for taking them as a veteran is that you need some way to deliver them into the enemy lines and you're very slow. So chances are good you're going to want to use your veteran move turn 1 to advance up the board. We then have 5 pox walkers and 1 regular plague marine with bolt gun. The reason for not using 6 pox walkers is that you then got through an uncomfortable level where there were still 10 points left to spend but nothing to spend them on. So we went with an extra plague marine and only 5 pox walkers. Death watch. Now for those of you playing Death Watch for the first time and you've just picked up a Death Watch Kill Team box, a lot of people are going to tell you this is the time to magnetise, and I have to agree. If you have the energy within you to magnetise your Kill Team, you probably should. However, if you don't, what I've given you here is a pretty solid little list, and honestly, all of these can easily be used in any other Death Watch list as well. It's not overly complex. So your Watch Sergeant is your leader, and he's going to take a Combi Melter and a Power Mall. Now I've gone with the Combi Melter because it's one point cheaper than a Combi Melter and it doesn't have the risk of killing your leader. I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. The Infernus Heavy Bolter as a Sniper. You might ask why an Infernus Heavy Bolter as a Sniper. It's part Flamer, part Heavy Bolter. You're going to need those rerolls, but let's get into that in a moment. You're going to take a regular Death Watch Veteran Gunner with a Frag Cannon. Now he's not a specialist, a lot of people are very afraid of the frag cannon and you don't want to give them any more reason to shoot at the frag cannon, trust me. So he can just be a regular guy. We then take a Reaver Sergeant, this guy is just really good. I think he's very strong, just like he was in Adeptus Astartes. He's a combat, he's going in there with 5 attacks, he's getting work done. And he adds a very serious melee threat to this otherwise entirely ranged list. Finally we have an Intercessor Sergeant with a Bolt Rifle, Chainsword and Aw Specs who is a comms. Typically you're going to want to keep this guy next to the Infernus Heavy Bolter to buff that up and let you absolutely dominate enemies from afar. However, he is kitted out very well to kill things in combat, almost as well as the Reaver Sergeant. So honestly, don't be afraid to move him. And if you do decide that you like a more aggressive style of play with him, Perhaps consider swapping the Infernus Heavy Bolter to a Heavy so that it can move without taking a negative to hit. And the Infernus Heavy Bolter wants to be buffed fully with the Norse Specs and Comms so that he's always hitting on 2s and with Sniper re-rolling 1s. And you have the option against tough models, for example Terminators, to be using the tactic Hellfire Shells. Where all you have to do is hit the enemy and if you manage that on a single dice you inflict D3 mortal wounds very strong against the right models. Drukhari. Now this was the slightly odd list. I'm going to have to get this out there now. Drukhari could be a very fluffy team, but because of the way that they are built, but because of the way you have to build their army, you typically have to go one way or the other when it comes to whether you're picking their sub-factions as a Cabal, as a Coven, or as a Witch Cult. We go with a Night Fiend as your leader. The reason for this is that all of the Mandrakes are at a minus one to hit at all times, which actually, along with their 5 up invulnerable save, makes them one of the hardest to kill models in the Drukhari lineup. There are then 6 Mandrakes, one of which is a combat, one of which is a veteran, and finally an Incubus who is a zealot. Now normally people would rather take a Clavex instead of an Incubus here, but due to points limitations, and my cheapest model being 12 points here, I couldn't quite swing it. You'd have to lose an entire model just to fit a Clavex in there and you'd have nothing to replace it with. Due to the makeup of this list, although Drukhari do have full access to sub-factions, even if you pick a sub-faction, none of your models will benefit for it because they all count as mercenaries. So there's no need to pick one. Your general tactic with this list is do whatever the hell you want. 
Mandrakes are very, very strong, always at a minus one to hit in both shooting and melee. And both of their shooting and melee attacks are really quite good. The only thing you really want to do and focus on here is your Incubus wants to get into combat. He's pretty damn deadly. Elucidian Star Striders. Now you might look at this and say, Glass, you have messed up. There are way too many specialisms there. And you, yeah, you'd think that. But actually, no. Nosoprond, Larson van der Graus, and Sanastasia Mint are all specialist retainers, which means that they can be a specialist that doesn't subtract from your regular allotment of three specialists. So you get a free combat, comms, and medic. Then we have three specialisms to throw around, heavy, demo, and veteran. The reason I went with a heavy on the Voidsman Gunner is that the regular Voidsman can't be a heavy, so that would be a waste otherwise. And I made Axemillion a veteran for one important reason. A lot of people look at the veteran and they think to themselves, this is a great way to make a turn one veteran move, very fast, very aggressive model. But actually, Axemillion only has a leadership of five, which means as soon as you lose one of your own models, he's at a 50-50 at best to pass his leadership check. Veteran means that he ignores any negatives. The main thing to think about here is that your Voidsman Gunner can get some serious work done, he's got a very scary gun, and Nosoprond is an absolute beast in combat. Go for it. Gelapox Infected. Now you actually have a few different ways to build the Gelapox. I've gone with what I consider to be a, a pretty all-rounder list, which is a Gelapox Mutant as your leader, two Gelapox Mutants, one Combat, one Zealot, and a Nasher Screamer, as a veteran. Now of course the Nasher Screamer is an absolute beast in combat and that's exactly why I don't give him either combat or zealot. However he is one of the slowest models in the game which is why I give him veteran so that you can make that turn one veteran move and advance and hopefully aim to get him into combat if not turn one turn two. But if you don't give him veteran you're kind of on the edge you might not get him into combat till turn three and then he's basically wasted points you might as well not take him. Everything else here, honestly, you can just take whatever you want. I quite like Glitchlings because they get their five up, feel no pain save to stick back and sit on a, our objectives on your side of the board. And then both Curse Mites and Icing Swarms are very fast and that's pretty scary for an enemy. You have absolutely no shooting in this list and that's really the big negative. Just keep in mind that with the small guys, the Icing Swarms and the Curse Mites, if they get shot, they're probably dead. So although they're hard to hit, they are fragile. The absolute worst thing you can go up against here are flamers and somebody that knows how to use board control against you. Gene Stealer Colts. Now I think anybody looking at this list that has picked up one box of Neophytes and one box of Acolytes will see that this is a pretty good list actually. You get to take pretty much everything you want and still have a decent number of models. So let's go over them quickly. We've got a regular Neophyte leader with a bolt pistol and chainsword as your leader. He is obviously going to sit at the back and not do much. We then have two Acolyte Fighters, one with a Heavy Rock Sword, one with a Heavy Rock Cutter, one a Zealot, one a Combat. Now, the Heavy Rock Cutter is something we have to talk about. If you're new to Gene Stealer Cults, just keep in mind the Heavy Rock Cutter is literally the best weapon in the game. A very common list will take four Heavy Rock Cutters. They are very, very good. They are a minus one to hit, but you're then wounding pretty much everything on twos and it's got really high AP, and then you don't even have to make an injury roll, essentially, you just kill everything in the base game. Very, very strong, and I cannot recommend them enough. Their negative, however, is that they will die to a stiff breeze, so you've got to be very protective of them, and very cunning, and hope that you have enough terrain on the board. We then have an Acolyte Leader with a Lash Whip and Bone Sword. Now, just like the Acolyte Fighter before him, he will die to a stiff breeze, and that's why we give him a Lash Whip. So all we need to do is get him into combat, and then even if he dies, he still gets to attack. We then take a Metamorph Leader with an Auto Pistol, Renegade Metamorph Whip. We take the Whip for exactly the same reason as above, and we then take a Hybrid Metamorph with the same as the Leader, except he's gonna be getting one less attack. And again, with a Whip, because he's gonna die. We then get two Neophyte Gunners, one of them a Demo. If you've been watching this all the way through, you will notice that whenever I have a flamer, I pretty much make them a demo or a veteran, but typically a demo. It's just a really good combination. It means you're wounding most things in the game on at least threes and then just four regular neophyte hybrids. They can sit around on objectives. 
You can go auto guns or shotguns. I prefer auto guns because you don't really want to be too close to the enemy. Now the Gene Stealer cults have a lot of very interesting sub factions, but to keep it pretty simple for you, I would say go with the Twisted Helix. It makes your team faster, and let's not forget that your guys are fragile, so you do want to be getting them into the enemy at the absolute latest turn two. So on turn one, the extra two inches you get from advancing is going to be very much needed. Grey Knights. Now this list I've done a little bit differently to others, because if you remember in the last video I said you can buy a strike squad, and in addition a terminator. The reason for that is because I wanted to give you guys a little bit of extra to do with them because if you don't do that with the terminator then the grey knights have a pretty well defined best list and you'll never really change anything but the addition of a terminator allows you to kind of stay a bit more interested. You have a just car with a pair of nemesis falchions as your leader, you then have a grey knight gunner with a silencer as a demolitions the reason for that is that you'll only be strength 4, this will allow you to be wounding on 3s instead of 4s typically. Then take a Grey Knight as a combat with a Demon Hammer, and then in your regular list you're going to take 2 more Grey Knights with Falchions, one of them will be a Zealot. In case you're wondering, the Falchions are always the best option, you don't really need to take any others. I am probably one of the few people that wouldn't recommend magnetising your Strike Squad. Uh, you can do it of course, but there's really no need. Falchions are the best, go with them, you don't need swords or halberds. However, sometimes you are going to want to take a terminator, who knows why, just to mix it up I suppose, at which point you can drop two of the grey knights with the regular falchions, one of them being a zealot, and put in the terminator gunner with the nemesis four sword and an incinerator, he can be a heavy. The trick there will be to drop him behind enemy lines when you need to. Harlequins. Well, this might seem a little bit of an odd list, but I think I've made it work. Don't forget, we've only gone with a single box here. Along with Grey Knights, it's one of the few one box kill teams. Now, your leader is going to take a Neuro Disruptor and Harlequins Embrace. The reason for the Neuro Disruptor is that it's pretty much just better than the Shuriken Pistol, and it gives you your longest range because you're probably not going to want to run up. Because don't forget that this is generally a game of holding objectives. You have to have a model that can sit back and do nothing. And the reason for the Harlequin's Embrace is because I had the points. We then have our two beat sticks in combat. They both take a regular Shuriken Pistol and two Harlequin Kisses. They're a combat and a zealot. Now, typically the Harlequin's Kiss is the best weapon, and so you could put it on every single model. Certainly, if I were to redo this list with more boxes, I'd probably drop some of the Neuro Disruptors and Fusion Pistols and go with more Harlequin's Kisses. However, from a single box, you only get two of every special weapon. The only thing you get more than two of are the Shuriken Pistols and the Harlequin Blades, which are typically the worst weapons. We then have a regular guy with a Neuro Disruptor and a Harlequin's Caress, and two players with Fusion Pistols Harlequin's Embrace on one as a veteran, Harlequin's Caress on the other. Now again, some of these are going to seem like odd pairings, but don't forget that we only have a single box to work with, with two of every special weapon. And we give the veteran to somebody with a fusion pistol, because who knows, you might be able to get far enough up to get a turn one shot with a fusion pistol, which is really strong. Now the Harlequins have a lot of very interesting sub-factions, but I'm going to have to say, for sake of ease and beginner list building, go with Frozen Stars, everybody gets one extra attack. Simple, really good. Heretic Astartes, or for those that used to be cool, Chaos. They're just, they're just called Chaos. Right, first up we have a Cultist Champion with an Autogun as our leader. Again, cheap leaders tend to stay at the back of the board because you it's a game of holding objectives at the end of the day. We then get a Cultist Gunner with a Flamer as Demo. Flamer, Demo, it's a match made in heaven. We then get a Berserker Champion with a Lightning Claw, Chainsword, and he's our combat. Berserkers are really good. There's just no other way to put it. The Berserker Champion will get to fight twice. Potentially, he can have up to six attacks if you give him Mark of Corn. Very strong model. Now, you might notice that you didn't actually buy a Berserker Champion, is that you didn't actually buy a Berserker box. But not to worry, in the standard Chaos Space Marine set, you will have enough bits to cobble something together. And it's not the end of the day if you have to proxy a chainsaw for a power axe or anything crazy like that. People aren't going to be too confused. We then take a Chaos Space Marine Gunner with a plasma gun 
as a sniper. The plasma gun and sniper is a classic pairing. It's like cheese and wine, or my life and depression. They really go well together. It doesn't really need any explanation. We then go with another Chaos Space Marine Gunner and an auto cannon. These two can lay down some serious, really scary, heavy fire whilst the rest of your models move up the board. We then take six Chaos Cultists and one Corn Berserker again. Now, I suppose the only thing I need to mention here is that the original Chaos Cultist gunner with a flamer doesn't actually come in the Cultist of the Abyss box. However, the Cultist of the Abyss box does come with a Cultist Special Champion that clearly has a flame sticking out at the end of a pole. Boom, conversion done. Technically a proxy. You're welcome. I don't feel I'm making you take the biggest leaps of faith here. I think we can all handle that one. Now when it comes to sub-factions, the Heretic Astartes have a lot of interesting options, but really, you're going to want to look at either World Eaters, so that your Berserkers can at get one extra attack on the charge, or you're going to want to look at Renegades, which means you can reroll charges. It's really your decision there. Crute. This is Crute. We're going to take a Crute Carnival as a leader, we're then going to take four Crute Hounds, because Crute Hounds are really good. One of them's going to be a combat. Now we do take a Crutox Rider as well. I've gone with a Heavy. You could also take it as a combat, but when you take it as a combat, you're removing the combat specialism from something else in your army, and anybody that lets the Crutox Rider get into their lines has seriously messed up, so I prefer to shoot with it. And then you just fill out fruit Carnivores until you've got no more points left which will be seven. One of them's a zealot, because why not? The other way to build the Crute is to ignore the Crute Ox Rider and go ham with Crute Carnivores. It's an option. Necrons. Now there are a lot of different ways you can build Necrons, but we've only bought a Warrior set, an Immortal set, and a single Lich Guard. So we can't build them exactly as we want. The first thing we're going to do, however, is learn that Warriors are better models for Flayed Ones than Flayed Ones because the Flayed Ones kit is pretty expensive for five models and it's in fine cast, which isn't typically reviewed well by the community, shall we say. So what you're going to want to do there is make at least three Warriors Flayed Ones. All you have to do for that is don't give them guns, cut off their hands and put spikes on the end. Boom, you've got a Flayed One. Good job. One of them's going to be a Zealot. Now Flayed Ones are very scary, so good stuff. We're going to have three Immortals, all of them with a Gorse Blaster, but there's actually no difference if you want to give it a Tesla. Feel free, it's your choice. One of them's going to be a leader, one of them's going to be a comms. And our Lich Guard will have a War Scythe because it's a very, very scary weapon and he'll be a combat and he will be an absolute beast in combat. Now, because this army is so middle of the road for Necrons, you have a bit of shooting and a bit of melee, but you're not specializing in either. You can go with pretty much any dynastic code you want. However, even here, when you're almost 50-50 mix, I'm still going to say you should go Novok, which is on the turn you charge, you can re-roll failed hits. Very strong, especially with that Lich Guard. Orcs. Remember how I told you to buy a box of knobs? Well, that box of knobs comes with a single Gretchen. Guess what that Gretchen is? That's right, obviously, he's your leader. So moving on from that absolute travesty of lore, so we're then going to take a boss knob with a combi scorcher and a chopper and he will be a demo. This is an absolutely stunning model. That combi scorcher is lethal to anything it comes near. Don't forget that you have tactics to allow you to shoot twice or shoot overwatch twice. This is a terrifying gun and it can seriously control a board because even though it's only damage one, you are able to shoot twice. Very strong, always take it. We're then going to take an elite knob as a combat with a big chopper and a slugger. Some people like to take the power claws, but personally, I like the two damage of a big chopper. It's just really good. We're then going to take an orc boy gunner with a big shooter as a veteran. Now again, a lot of people like to think of veterans purely as a way to make a turn one move. But with this guy, you're going to want to keep him at the back, so you won't be taking that turn one move. And that's a good thing, because you are going to be spending all of your CP elsewhere. You don't have one CP to spare on that veteran move. However, because he's a veteran, he cannot break because he's not taking any negatives from all of your orc boys that die in their thousands as they run up the board, which is also good because he's going to be on his own because everybody else has run up the board. We're then going to take nine orc boys. We're going to take four with sluggers and choppers 
and then we're going to take five with shooters. Now the real reason for this is that choppers have gone up one point and I don't think they're as good as they used to be to be honest. Also, I got to the point where I didn't have any more orc boys to add to the list and I didn't want to drop any to add in another knob, so we've ended up in a weird situation. Needless to say, orc boys can get some serious work done. People are going to tell you to always take choppers, but I assure you shooters are pretty good as well because even a base orc with a shooter and not a chopper is pretty scary in close combat. When it comes to orcs and a beginner list, you can take any clan, culture, sub-faction that you want. For your information, the lists that have kind of won big tournaments so far have all used Evil Sons, which gives you a plus to your move and advance, and that is actually really strong, so I'd probably recommend that, just because the basic move of 5 is pretty slow and painful to use. But none of them are bad. Oh, apart from Blood Axes. Don't take Blood Axes, everything else is good. Servants of the Abyss. Now, Servants of the Abyss have some really strong models, but they also have limit caps on what you can take. So, for example, the Negavolt Cultist is an absolute standout model, but you can only take four. If there wasn't a limit on that, you'd probably just take one Traitor Sergeant as a leader and nothing but Negavolt Cultists. But because you can't, what we're doing is taking a Traitor Sergeant as a leader, two Negavolt Cultists, one a Combat, one a Zealot, two more Negavolt Cultists, a Rogue Psyker because hey, four wounds and being able to Psychic is pretty damn good, four Chaos Beastmen because okay they're not Negavolt Cultists but they're still really good, and finally a Traitor Guardsman Gunner with a Flamer as a Veteran. Now I went with the Flamer as a Veteran instead of a Demolitions in this particular instance. Either one is good but I went with Veteran because a lot of your guys are going to die and you want somebody that can't shake, basically. Sisters of Silence. Now this is a brilliant team to consider magnetizing on. It's a single box, it gets you 10 guys, or girls, sorry, and there are enough models in there to build all 10 of them as any of the possible weapon options, whether that's bolters, flamers, or greatswords. But for those of you that don't particularly want to magnetize, I came up with what I think is a pretty decent little all-rounder list. We've got a Prosecutor Superior as a leader, a Witch Seeker as a demo, a Vigilator as a combat, a Witch Seeker as a veteran, three more Witch Seekers and a Prosecutor. Now this wasn't my first attempt at the list, at 100 points you're a little bit limited. I would have actually liked to have taken a Witch Seeker Superior and a Vigilator Superior, but I didn't have the points. If we bumped up to 125, that would be the first change I made, adding those three models in. But at 100 points, you just can't do it, and I didn't want to drop below 8 models, so I took them out. It's pretty obvious what's happening here. Your Witch Seekers are putting down some serious area control. Anybody that wants to charge you has the possibility of just losing all of their models. The Vigilator will be an absolute beast in combat, and the Prosecutor there, well, I'm going to be honest, that second prosecutor is only there because I didn't have the points. However, they do have a very nice tactic that turns their bolt gun into an assault three, so don't be afraid to use that. Tau Empire. Now, with only a Pathfinders and a Strike Team box, we've had to make what most people wouldn't consider a strong Tau team. But don't feel bad because this is actually a strong Tau team. A lot of people tend to consider that Tau should have, well, the more drones the better. Firstly, it's not the most fun way to play Tau. Drones typically are very expensive, as you only get two in a box, and this is a beginner's guide. So first up, we just have a regular Fire Warrior Shasui with a pulse rifle, a pulse pistol, and a marker light. He's going to be your leader. That's all we need to know, he can sit at the back. In fact, any model with a pulse rifle can sit at the back because you have a really long range of 30 inches, so you don't have to worry about moving. We then have the Holy Trinity, which is three Pathfinder Gunners. We've got two rail rifles, one as a demo, one as a comms, and an iron rifle as a sniper. The reason I went with an iron rifle as a sniper is because the iron rifle, much like a plasma gun, has the ability to remove you from combat if you roll a one, but of course the sniper allows you to re-roll ones. Also, I don't think you get a third rail rifle in the box. I could be wrong on that. Either way, it's not a bad pick. A lot of people think that the Rail Rifle is just straight up superior, and if anybody tells you you're doing poorly by taking Iron Rifle, just kill them with the Iron Rifle. They're going to be confused. Don't worry, it'll work. We then take Chasselin with a Pulse Rifle and Pulse Pistol. 
they're going to be paired with the DS8 tactical support turret with smart missile system. Now for those of you that don't know, the tactical support turret cannot be moved once deployed without spending CP, but the smart missile system doesn't require line of sight and can hit anywhere on the board within range on sixes, a match made in heaven, clearly. We then take another chassel out with pulse rifle, pulse pistol, followed by four gun drones, and finally an MB3 recon drone. Now your recon drone is going to stay up with your Pathfinder gunners, because it's essentially the same as an all specs for everybody else. And when paired with the comms, allows any of them to hit on threes, and of course the sniper will be re-rolling ones. And finally, when it comes to the sub-faction, I'm going to recommend the Sassia Sept. Tau is also a good sept though, it's your choice there. Thousand Suns. Now a lot of people, when you're first looking at the Thousand Suns, will assume that the Aspiring Sorcerer, as one of only two models in the core set that can be a leader, should be the leader. And it makes sense, he's a very strong, powerful model. Most people, once they've played for a little bit, will realise that he should probably be a combat instead. And you want to find the points to make a Zangor Twist Bray your leader. I say give that twist spray an auto pistol and chainsaw, the reason for that being that you don't want your leader to be in combat, and an auto pistol gives you at least a chance to do something against some weak enemy. Then a rubric marine gunner with a soul reaper cannon as a demo, a zangor with blades and a bray horn, he's going to be your comms and typically you're going to want to try and keep him within 6 of the soul reaper cannon. But conversely, you're also going to want to try and keep him within the Brayhorn range of your Zangors to give them pluses to the advance and charge. You're then going to take five Zangors with Zangor blades and then one Zangor with an auto pistol. A lot of people don't rate Zangors with auto pistols, but the thing is, those guys with auto pistols, they're not moving up the board. They're staying right at the back. And chances are pretty good that whatever's ending up charging you they're going to kill you anyway, whether you have Zangor Blades or an Auto Pistol and Chainsword. And at least with the Auto Pistol, you can make a shot or two. The general gist here is pretty simple. The Aspiring Sorcerer wants to get into combat, partly so that he can, well, just absolutely mush things with his Force Stave, but also so that you can do some nice movement shenanigans and cybolt whoever you want. The Rubric Marine Gunner is going to lay down some very, very scary fire across the entire board, backed up by a comms, so that's terrifying right there, wounding pretty much everything in the game on twos. With AP minus two, you're practically guaranteed to get straight through to the injury roll. And then Zangles are actually really strong in combat and should never be underestimated. So they're just gonna swarm the enemy, simple stuff. Tyranids. Finally, yes, finally we have Tyranids. So our leader is going to be a Tyranid Warrior Gunner, with bone saws and venom cannon. Now the venom cannon is a very strong weapon. In fact, the only time you wouldn't want to make it the venom cannon and instead take the barbed strangler is when you're up against models with an invuln save. But because I'm trying to give you single lists instead of entire rosters, the venom cannon is a safe choice. Then as backup with our tyranid warrior gunner, we take a tyranid warrior bone saws death spitter as a comms. Now, I wouldn't typically recommend Death Spitter, but we had the points to spare, so why not? What you're going to want to do is try and keep your leader and your comms relatively centre of the board, but six inches apart. So you're able to spread out your Synapse Aura whilst keeping your deadly Venom Cannon within six inches of your comms buff so that you can actually hit stuff, because otherwise you're probably hitting on fives and it's a terrible thing. Our Gene Sealer is going to be a veteran and is going to take Scything Talons and an Acid Maw. The Acid Maw is a very strong pick with the Gene Sealer and is most people's default. We're then going to take 10 Hormigants because that is the entire box of Hormigants and we can't take any more. Now, going back to your Tyranid Warrior box, one of them can very, very easily be converted into a Lictor. All you do is put the Scything Talons facing up a little bit and then instead of giving them a gun on the bottom, give them more Talons. Boom, you've got yourself a Lictor. You can swap your Tyranid Warrior out and instead put the Lictor as a combat in there because it is a very scary model. The Tyranids have a lot of interesting sub-factions, but at the end of the day, with this list especially because you have so many Hormigants, you're probably going to want to take Kraken because it means when the enemy falls back from you, you aren't left stranded with nothing at all to do. Okay, everybody, this has been Glass Half Dead giving you a quick rundown for beginner lists, taking you to 100 points, and just hopefully giving you the reassurance that 
yes, what you've picked isn't terrible and you can take pretty much anything you want. And these are great lists that you can start from and then experiment out as you wish. Coming up next for the Kill Team Beginner's Guide is going to be how to start hobby. It's going to go over everything from the absolute basic tools you need just to put models together, which paint brand is the best to buy, and even hopefully within a nice short 10 minutes, unlike this video obviously, I'm going to be doing a complete guide on how to speed paint models because that's what I've really become best at because it's easy to become good at unlike actual artwork that most people prefer to aim for when they're painting models. Okay everybody, I hope you've had a good day, I hope you continue to have a good day, and I hope you enjoy Kill Team. Goodbye.